Tonight, we will take both the law and the promise. Just a little while on the promise, that you may not be concerned. For I do know that so many people tell us that we must do this, that, and the other, or else, but you forget it. God planned everything as it has come out and as it will be consummated. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You do not earn it. It's not your due. It's not a reward. It's simply a gift, unmerited. And therefore, you cannot lose it. This gift is irrevocable. So no man can take it from you. No man can give it to you. So let no one frighten you. It is yours and it's coming on time. And the gift is nothing less than God himself. When he gives you the kingdom, he gives you himself. For the kingdom is not a realm. The kingdom is a character. It's a body. And that body is perfect. And wherever you are clothed in that body, everything around you is perfect. No matter where you go, were you in the petrified forest, it would burst into foliage. Were you in the desert, it will simply blossom like the rose. Were you in the midst of all broken members of society, they would all be in harmony. If you came into a world where they were blind, vain, halt, withered, instantly as you glide by, eyes that were missing would come out of the nowhere and fill the empty sockets. Arms that are missing feet missing, everything will be made perfect because you are present. That is God's gift, which is the gift of himself, which is his body. One day you'll be clothed with that body. So set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ within you. That is the unfolding within you of God and his son. And this is the hope that makes it wisdom to endure the burden of this long dark night of time. For as Paul said, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. We are told we are justified by his grace. Well, justification in Scripture is divine acquittal. You're completely acquitted. No matter what you have ever done, you are acquitted. So when we are told, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So justification is simply divine acquittal. And glorification is the gift of God himself to you. So that man then matures when he becomes his own father. So, we say, it is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. In giving us the kingdom, he gives us himself. In giving us himself, man becomes his own father. So, let no one worry you, let no one in any way suggest that you've got to do something to earn it. You cannot earn the kingdom. You cannot earn this gift. This is a gift. Unmerited. And it's not your due. Were it your due, then it's not a gift. It's not given as a reward. You are made fit for the kingdom. And your fitness for the kingdom is the consequence, not the condition 
of his gift. The minute he gives you himself, you are fitted for the kingdom and you wear the body of God. And everything in your presence while you wear it is made perfect. But having given us the promise, the promise comes first in scripture. Then we are told he gave us the law. The law to cushion us while we as pilgrims walk through the furnaces. And so we have a law. Man is not aware of the law. Even the wisest of men, they're not aware of it. I'll go back now to 1949. I was in Milwaukee. And I gave a series of lectures on the Bible. And this couple, he was a physicist, the head physicist of Alice Chalmers. They're a huge, big manufacturing firm making these turbines, sometimes bigger than this interior. And he was the head of the chemical department, where there were same waters from all over the world who bought the turbine. And he would analyze the water to discover the problem that they faced, because the water, as it came through the stream, gathered the chemicals. And then the chemicals deposited itself within the turbine. And so they would send him samples of the water. And then he would analyze the water and then send them the solution to their problem. Well, being a trained chemist and the head of the department, he didn't take issue with me. But he said, Neville, I can't quite go along with you. Because as a chemist, it's in conflict with my training. You tell me that you can go forward in time. That you can move backwards in time. That all things are. And everything is now, at this very moment. And yet you're telling me you can make things change, and it's in conflict with my training. We have a law known, said he, and we call it entropy. And entropy means that the past is fixed and unalterable. You cannot change it. If that could be changed, it throws everything out of kilter in my lab. I must know the past is unalterable, like braiding a lady's hair. And the braided part, that's fixed. The rest is future, not yet braided. We are waiting to see how it will develop from the braided part. Because that is completely fixed and unalterable. And you tell me it is not. That the whole vast world exists now. Past present and future, and that you can go into these sections of time in a world that is finished. But I can't go along with that. That's perfectly all right. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a scientist, so I cannot argue the point with you. I only know my visions, and I teach vision as I have actually experienced it. And I can go into these spots. I have gone into these places, and the past has not passed away. And it's fixed, as you say, but I'm quite sure one could go back and revise that past and change it. And I can go forward into the future that I do know and set it up to walk across a bridge of incident. When I come to that point in time where I have entered, it takes on the color and the tone and the reality that I assumed it to be when I entered that state. Can't be done. But he was a very honest man, as most of these fellows are. They're trained to be honest. How else could they achieve what they do achieve in science unless they're perfectly honest with themselves? Well, in the month of November, I received a letter from him. And he sent me the science newsletter dated October the 15th. And it was all about the positron. And the one who wrote it was Professor Richard Feynman. He was then professor of physics at Cornell University. Twenty years later, only last year, they granted him the Nobel Prize in Physics for that paper. It took them twenty years to recognize what he said as theory back in 1949. And if I can quote it, this is it. The positron is a wrong way electron. It's wrong way in every sense of the word. It moves backwards in time. It moves from where it hasn't been. 
and speeds to where it was an instant ago. Arriving there, it is bunked so hard, its time sense is reversed, and it moves back to where it hasn't been. Now, that is not Neville speaking. That is Professor Feynman. For that, he got the Nobel Prize last year. He said it's not only backwards in that sense, but even its charge is backwards. It's a positron. It's positive and not negative. And yet, it is an electron. When they first observed it, or rather had it as theory, they did not want to admit it. But yet it fitted in with Einstein's theory, mathematically. So they had to in some way accept it, but no one had ever photographed it. Then came someone who photographed it in their studies of the cosmic rays. And here it was the actual positron. It seemed as though two were developed at a certain point. And it wasn't, said he, that one coming back, which was the positron, should, if it is bumped, it should be deflected and continue on its course, but deflected course. On the other hand, if it's bumped so hard, it's not deflected, it's reversed and moves forward in a normal manner to where it hasn't been. Well, I told him that I would sit at home and I would go into a section of time, even uh, this year, for instance. This is now only April. I put myself in, East, in Christmas. I would feel the stores are all dressed for Christmas. I could hear the musical Christmas, all the carols. I'd walk through Saks Fifth Avenue in New York City, go into Best, go into the other. And I would feel all that I would feel if it were true that it's Christmas. That is the month of Christmas. And then when I feel that it's all Christmas, then I would feel that things are as I desire them to be back in the month, say, of March or July, which was certainly not Christmas season. So take a hot, hot day in July, and I'm feeling it to be cold and snow on the ground and all the dressings for Christmas. And then I would open my eyes and bounce back and shock myself because it seems so real to me that when I came back and opened my eyes upon July and it's hot, I thought, now, are you kidding yourself? No, when I went forward in time, quite normally, waiting out the days, the months, to the month of December, things happened as I actually had assumed that they would. I went forward and determined, predetermined, what would happen. Well, when he sent me this, he wrote a sweet, lovely letter saying, Neville, I... I must confess, I didn't see it. No one saw it until Professor Feynman in his lab discovered this. But he discovered it by theory. And you tell me, you know it by vision. You're not a scientist, and yet all that you say to me, which I could not believe, and even in this moment, it's difficult for me to believe. Here comes a great professor, a theoretical physicist, and he is the one who wrote this paper. For that, he got the Nobel Prize last year. He worked on our atomic bomb. He worked on the hydrogen bomb. Then he asked the government to relieve him of the secrecy imposed upon him because of his position. And he came here to Caltech and taught at Caltech theoretical physics. He said, I want the freedom of imagination. I said, I want to be confined with the secrets of government so that I could not express myself. Leave me alone, all in theory. So he goes blindly on with his mathematics and his theory, bringing out these concepts, all theory. Well, mine is not theory. I go into these states. Now, look at it this way. See the whole vast world as infinite states. All states. If they're all states and you are an immortal being, you're not a state, you are immortal. You enter a state and the state becomes alive. Therefore, you are not to blame if you enter a state unwittingly, and it's a horrible state. Man not knowing that you are in a state, they condemn you. But you have to express the contents of that state. <coughs> if you enter the state of poverty, you have to experience poverty. If you remain in it, you must go and drink that to the very last drop, the dregs of that cup. 
If you go into any state and remain in that state, you're going to drink it to the very last drop. But you can get out of a state. You don't have to remain in it if you know it's a state. If you don't know it's a state, you identify yourself with the state and think that you're it. Man has identified himself with this little body. And he thinks he is it. So the day comes, he has to discard it because he's worn it out. As he discards it, all of his friends are crying. <coughs> to think he died. He can't die. He is an immortal being who wore a garment of flesh. Flesh and blood. That same being who goes into states. Remaining in a state. And the state has to be expressed by him who resurrected the state. For I am the resurrection and the life of that state. Now, you can change an individual with or without his consent if you so desire. Here is the story of a friend of mine. I persuaded him to give up his job here. I knew he was a single man and he would like to do what I am doing. So I said, San Francisco is wide open. I only go there once a year for four weeks at a time. No, I have reduced it to two weeks at a time. But I used to go, in the early years, four weeks. I said, they need someone badly who knows this law. You can't teach the promise because you do not know it. You can tell it, but from hearsay, because you have not experienced the promise. But you do know the law. And you are presentable, you are a gentleman, you go up there, I will not give you any money. But I will give you my mailing list of 500, it's a live list, and you send out my list. When I go, I will tell them that I allowed you to have my list, and I will get behind you in that manner, but not in any other way. You've got to go on faith. Well, he quit his job here. He had seniority of eight years in the place that he worked. He goes up to San Francisco, and he made arrangements to open. He had a little dog. Lovely little dog. And he was walking this dog one afternoon before he opened. And a man came over and greeted him and said, what a nice little dog you have. And then after the usual greetings, he said, can you help me out? I haven't eaten today. I'm out of work. And my friend said, no, I have no money. But I will uh, do what I can, but I can't give you any money. The man couldn't quite understand that. You can't give me money. What else could you do? My friend did not move one step after he said no to the request. The man went on. He remained there until he imagined that man in his presence, gainfully employed, happy in the job, and standing on his own feet. That was taken the story in the book of Acts. When a man came to John and Peter, and he could not stand on his own feet. And he was begging at the temple door. And Peter said, Gold and silver have I not for thee, but such as I have, give I unto you. Rise and walk. And he rose and walked. It doesn't mean a cripple jumped up and walked. That's an entire different structure that I do know is possible when you wear the garment of God. You couldn't come into the presence of anyone as a cripple. The minute you came by, he ceases to be a cripple. If he has no feet, feet come and fill the sockets. If he's blind, they come in and fill the sockets. And he is not blind. And you do nothing to do it. No compassion. You simply are so perfect that nothing imperfect can remain in your presence. But in this case, on this level, no one is actually going to jump up from the crippled state and start walking. But he takes a man who is crippled, who is standing on other people's feet, by begging from them. Well, a month later, he was walking his dog and he saw this man and he crossed the street. The man crossed the street and came over to him. He said, I don't suppose you remember me. He said, oh, yes, I do. I remember you just about a month ago that you asked me for money. He said, yes, and I want to thank you for not giving it to me and extended his hand to my friend. He said, had you given me the money, I today would be asking you for money. Because you did not give me. I was so embarrassed and so annoyed with myself that I put myself in that position. I went out the very next day and I got a job. A good job. It pays well. And it has promise of growth. 
and I am very happy in the job. So again, let me thank you for not giving me the money. He put the man on his own feet by representing him to himself as one gainfully employed. That's what I'm talking about when I tell you the all states. He took him out of one state and put him in another state. The man who is in the new state is the same man. You are an immortal being. You are changing only when you fall into a state. And others who knew you well in one state think what has happened to him. You either go up or you go down. If they see a radical change and they wonder what has happened to him. He is affluent. He is this. He is that. Or what has happened to him. He used to be. Look at him now. And not a thing changed with the immortal being who occupies the state other than the state. He changed the state. Man not knowing that he condemns the state. When it's not the being that you're looking at, you're looking at a state. So God forgives everyone. He justifies everyone because he knows they're only in states. And the Lord created all these states. These are the states. So that's what Blake meant. When he said, I do not consider the just or the wicked to be in a supreme state. But to be every one of them states of the sleep, which the soul may fall into in its deadly dreams of good and evil. When it left paradise, following the serpent. Following the serpent, when man left that heavenly state of innocence and came into a world of experience, of educative darkness, and experience generation. For well, here we are generating and multiplying these garments to clothe the innocent one who has come down. So the whole drama is from innocence through experience to an awakened imagination. When the imagination completely awakes, that's the divine body, Jesus. That's God. And it takes all of this journey. We are the pilgrims moving through states. So I tell you, Master the art of moving from one state to another state. You are not the state. You never have been and you never will be. The state, if you are going to condemn, condemn the state. But why condemn anything? Moving out of a state into another state. Move yourself out of one state into another state. So others say it can't be done. Leave them alone. They say it can't be done. You go about your father's business moving from state to state as you desire. Now it all starts with a hunger. It starts with a real desire on your part. And all these infinite states are simply to satisfy the hungers of men. So you want to be good as you understand good to be. You want to be wealthy as you understand it. You want to be famous as you understand it. All these are states. Go into the states. Before you are qualified. Go into the state and stay there. The state has all the things necessary to externalize itself. But you are the occupant power. You have to go into the state and dwell there. Now, as I go into it, let me remain in it. If I come back like the Pothotron, I'm simply going to be turned right around. I'm not going to be deflected. And continue my journey in the same direction, only deflected. I'm going to be so shocked. And everyone is shocked. When I go into a state and it seems like this, it seems so real. When I open my eyes, well, here I am. Back there. But that shock turns me around from that return to my motion forward now as an electron. I'm not a positron anymore. I was a positron when I actually started back in time. And when I reached this body, and the body is jolted when I open my eyes, then what I did there, I am moving across a bridge of incident now, some series of events that leads me up to the fulfillment in what the world calls reality. But it was real when I occupied it in my imagination. That's when it was real. We exist in these bodies. We live in our imaginations. For our imaginations, these are the only realities. Imagination is God. There is the divine body, Jesus. I used to sit and simply try it in my living room. 
I couldn't see the chair where I sat in the living room from the telephone in the hallway. I would sit at the telephone in my imagination while my body was in the living room. And then I would assume I'm at the telephone. <laughs> Physically, I couldn't see that body. And then suddenly I would feel myself back on the chair. And what a shock. And then from the chair, I put myself back at the telephone. I would stand on the outside of the house and see it like this building. See it from the street rather than from here. And assume while I'm standing here that I am looking at the building from the outside. And suddenly you are on the outside. And you're looking at it from the outside. Do it with your own home. Do it with anything in your room. And that gets you sort of uh, in a state of moving. You, you become mobile, as it were. And it's easy then to occupy any state. And the only state. So when someone thinks themselves so important, it's only a state, but all right, that state in itself is important to them. And anyone occupying that state must do exactly what they would do. If I were in the state of Hitler, I would do the same thing Hitler did. Because it's a state. And if I fall into it, knowingly or unknowingly, I've got to play that part. So he does not consider the just or the wicked to be in a supreme state, but to be every one of them states of the sleep, which the soul falls into when it leaves paradise following the serpent, that serpent of generation. So here, you can be what you want to be if you know that all these are only states. And in the end, you are justified. You are completely exonerated. You are acquitted, divinely acquitted. So let no one frighten you as to what you must do to earn the kingdom. You do not earn the kingdom. It's your father's good pleasure to give it to you. And it's a gift that is not your due. It's not a reward for any good things you did. If you're in a state and you think that the good things you're doing is only the state. You moved into it and I personally find it easier living in my world to be in good states. I find it easier to be kind than to be unkind. If I'm ever unkind, it hurts me more than anyone who received my dog, as it were. An unkind remark hurts me more than the one who received it from me. So I find it easier to be in that sort of a state. But eventually, you will completely awake with a gift and the gift is God himself. There's nothing but God in this world. But nothing but God. Someone called me up and asked me about devils. <coughs> and she went down to this Christian science practitioner. Who now feels she is now hungry with devils. Well, they teach devils. How the devil does this, the devil does that. Like just getting away from the first and great commandment. Which is the great commandment, the Shema. The confession of faith in the Hebraic world. Hear, O God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The minute you get away from that, you have a devil. There's another God, another creator, another something. And you have two, you're going to have four, you're going to have eight, sixteen, thirty-two, and so on. Always come back to that fundamental state, there is only God. And God is your own wonderful human imagination. When you say, I am, that's God. There is no other and never will be another God. He is going to unfold himself within you and completely awaken. And when he awakens, you are God. And then you'll be clothed in that heavenly garment. And I'm telling you, it is a heavenly garment. I can't describe it other than to tell you, when you're in it, you're not standing on the earth. You're lifted off, as it were. And I can only describe it as air and fire. And when you glide by and the sea of humanity, imperfect, you do not raise one little finger to change them. No compassion. Because they cannot remain that way when you go by. And as you glide, uh, glide by, every one is made perfect. Every one, not one, is left out. Doesn't matter what he did to lose his eyes, 
what he did to lose his arms, to lose his legs, to lose his tongue. It doesn't matter what he did. In your presence, he cannot remain imperfect. And everyone is made perfect. That is the kingdom. So it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So set your hope fully upon this gift. And then you can endure the temporary ills of the world. Because we are moving through all these things and not every moment of time are we alert to these states and we can fall into it by reading the newspaper, fall into it by hearing a news bulletin, fall into it by a little conversation with a friend. And there we slip innocently into a state. But the state isn't, isn't concerned. You animated it. You made it alive when you entered it because you are the only resurrecting power in the world. You are the resurrecting living power of the world. And that power is your own wonderful human imagination. So everyone here, put your mind at peace and don't think for one moment by being good, as the world calls good, by attending certain services and doing certain things and observing certain things, that there's some being on the outside watching you and marking up some little thing in your favor. No, you're simply waiting for that appointed moment when he unveils himself. So you'll set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ within you, which is the Lord and his Son. That is Jesus Christ. The Lord and his Christ. And Christ is the Son of God. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the remembrance. Well, he doesn't really bring about that remembrance until the Son appears. And when the Son appears, memory returns, and then you know who the Lord is, because you know who his Son is. And you wear this little garment until a few more years. You take it off, and then you are not in this world at all. You are in an entirely different world, where... Everything is perfect because you are perfect. And when you want to make yourself seen by another, you make that choice. They do not come in search of you and see you. I'll give you one little story. She doesn't come here anymore. She may not be in the city. But she told me one night quite innocently. She said, you know, I found myself out. I was very, very conscious. And I said to these people around me, do you know of Neville? And they said, yes. And then she said, who is he? And with that, she said, I was whirled as though I was some meteor flying through space, thrown out of it were, and woke scared to death. You do not see one who has already been born from above until he chooses to show himself. He must manifest himself to you. You do not go looking for him. Because unless you are born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom. Even though it's his pleasure to give you the kingdom, it will come after your birth from above. Prior to that birth, he can't give you the kingdom. And one to whom he's already given the kingdom is not in the world. Though for a little while he is in the world telling the story, telling it from experience and not from theory. So I'm telling you, exactly what has happened to me. I share it with you. And it's going to happen to you, every one of you. So let no one in any way try to convince you that you must be a little better than you are if you would get the kingdom. The kingdom is your gift. And listen to the words in the 11th chapter of Romans. It is irrevocable. The gift and the call of God are irrevocable. You cannot revoke it, and no one can revoke it. And your inheritance is not only God. You're told in the fourth chapter of Romans, you inherit the world. The world is yours, and all within it. You don't inherit some little portion of the world. You inherit God, and God owns the world, and the world is your inheritance. So in the 16th Psalm, David is made to say, the portion of my inheritance 
is the Lord. That's his portion. He inherits the Lord. The son inherits the father. And so a man matures when he becomes his own father. This is the great mystery of scripture. And you will inherit the father. For it is his will. And no one can break his will. It's your father's good pleasure to give you. So when you hear people bragging how this one is better than the other one, forget it. They're judging states. So that man is richer because he's a state that is richer than the other state that is poor. But the occupant of the rich state does not differ from the occupant of the poor state. And the occupant of the state tonight that is in jail does not differ from the judge who sentenced them. One is not better than the other in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, all are acquitted. That's justification. We are justified by his grace, we are told. All are justified by his grace. And grace is an unearned, unmerited gift of God. And that grace is God's last, his final gift, which is love in action. And God is love. It's his gift of himself. And that's when he gives you himself. There's not a thing else to give. He gave you himself. And the whole vast world is yours. So we inherit the earth. Now tonight, I hope you'll start practicing. Won't take you any time at all to try it. It costs you nothing. And it works wonders. You can sit here tonight or you go home. Put yourself in a state of affluence. What's wrong with that? I know, well, back in the 1920s, 1930s, we had a deep depression beginning in 29. And do you know that you could go to Tiffany and buy, say, eight glasses, beautiful glasses for a wedding present, cost you what? Not more than 75 cents. A beautiful glass. And in a Tiffany box. The whole thing was a Tiffany box. Beautifully done. You'd go to Macy's or Gimbel's. And you'd buy something not comparable for a dollar. Dollar twenty-five. But the majority would not be seen dead in Tiffany. That was style. That was something beyond them. They wouldn't even walk in. They felt embarrassed to walk in. Yet you could go into Tiffany, the jewels on the first floor, take the elevator to the third, where they had the lovely china and lovely glassware on another floor, and get a beautiful gift wrap package from Tiffany. You didn't have to send two dozen, eight, that's enough, eight beautiful glasses. And people would not go in. They were embarrassed to be seen in Tiffany. I'm quite sure... It's the same thing is true here with their branch hair. And you could go to Tiffany and buy a lovely thing for but very little, really. But people are trained. That means something that's classy and that, 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 and the other. And if you're in one state, you can't argue them out of it. They've got to get out of that state to be able to go into a state. And if you tell them, you know, what one time in your life, a $12 suit is all that you could afford and all you thought you could ever afford. You get out of that state and think something differently. And then you pay $250 for a suit easier than you could get up the $12 for the other suit. I know it happened in my own case. When I began to buy a suit for $250, it was easier for me to pay $250. And when I had to get up $12, for a suit. That if it rained, I had to start running. <laughs> or I couldn't get out of it. Now that is life. And you simply move from one state into another state. And the same being, I'm not another being. I answered the same name. You say Neville, I answer. I answered then to the name Neville. And yet I move from one state to another state to another state. As you move from one state, what you couldn't do in one state you find it so easy to do in the other state. I was in a state for the longest while where I couldn't eat meat, fish, fowl, drink alcohol, smoke, sex. Well, I did nothing, but nothing. 
Then overnight, my friend Abdullah told me, you're going to come back from Barbados and you will have died, you know. I said, I will die. He said, I don't mean that you're going to die and be buried in Barbados or buried at sea, but you will have died. All the things you haven't done in seven years, you will be doing before you get back. Do you know he was true? And I couldn't tell you how it happened. I couldn't tell you how it happened. It just happened. In Barbados, I lived for three months with my, in my mother's home and still lived as I did in New York City. And on my trip north in 10 days, I was doing everything I hadn't done in seven years. And I cannot tell you how it happened. I moved out from one state into another state, and it came to me as normal and as natural to do the things I did at sea as I did in seven years the other things that I didn't do. So I tell you, the only states, all states of consciousness, and if you recognize that, you can forgive every being in this world, no matter what he is or what he plans to be or what he's done. Because in the end, he is going to be justified. He is justified by the grace of God, as we are told. Everyone is justified by the grace of God. He is divinely acquitted. And when God acquits him, who is going to judge him? And after justification comes glorification. So he begins with those whom he foreknew. Well, he foreknew us. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And if he chose me in him before the foundation of the world, then he knew me. And those whom he foreknew, well then he also predestined. He predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son that which reflects his glory and radiates his glory and bears the express image of himself. I am destined to be that, to be the express image of himself. And those whom he then predestined, he called, call my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Call them all. And he's calling us one by one by one, for we are so altogether unique. He can call us in pairs. Call us one by one. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So you are destined to be glorified with God as God. And it will not in any way be stopped by anyone. So let no one frighten you. From the Pulpits of the world, every Sunday morning, they try to scare the people to death. Set themselves up as the criterion of what people ought to be. In other words, look at me, they will say, and follow me. I saw in yesterday's this paper, this son of a very prominent evangelist across the country. He's in Barbados, he's in all the West Indies, he's all over Europe. Someone in Denmark wrote me three letters recently. Ask me what I think of him. Well, I did not respond. I answered his first two letters. And then when he kept on trying to make this a conversation between us, and he mentioned this party, I did not answer. I never listened to the man. I've never read any of his works. But when I read in the paper yesterday a picture of his son, who confessed that he was simply, uh, he had sinned against his wife and his children. Well, you know what he means. And then he sinned against God. Then I went on to read that this man takes in, in tithes, $30 million a year, in tithes. He tells them how they're serving God when they send him money. And taking in $30 million tax-free. It's religion. $30 million. So now the son has now been removed from being the heir. The father is 80 years old, but he's still in control of that 30 million a year tax-free. I wonder what he talks about. So that is big business. When you go into that sort of money, that's big business. And you have no room in your mind's eye for any spirituality, none whatsoever. And you can take that greatest of all books and make a mess of it. The interpreted there is something that is taking place here in secular world. It isn't secular at all. 
This story is profoundly, well, it's all spirituality. It's God's plan of redemption. It has nothing to do with the secular world. And they're telling you the future of America, the future of Russia, the future of China. It's not in Scripture. 